All right, so welcome back, everybody. So I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the, the first part of this lecture. Let me summarize what we've seen. We've seen that we need to store data beyond one machine. Typically, this is done with cloud storage, these uh, services that allow you to host data in the cloud. We see that typically a cloud storage like S3 is very simple. You have a get put based system. So it's really a key value model where you can get an object or a file from the cloud, or you can put an object or a file into the cloud up to five gigabytes at a time. And the total size that an object can have is five terabytes, right? Then we saw these guarantees with availability, consistency, and so on. And that if you want to be partition tolerance, when sometimes the, the network might break, you have to choose between availability and consistency. Now be careful because some people might want, might, we will try to trick you. You will see here and there people claiming to uh, have all three at the same time. We do have some questions from a student. Would that be okay? Yeah, I, I come to the question right away. I, I'm, I'm just finishing the recap. Then we come to the question and then I'll continue with the rest APIs. Okay, yeah. okay. thank you. So some people will try to trick you with this. They will claim to have partition tolerance and consistency and availability. Critical thinking, always try to understand what's going on. Typically the trick is that they, are, they claim to be all three just because they try to not ever have partition, uh, uh, partition breaks, right? And then of course they can be all three. But as soon as you do have them, then bad things can happen and you have to make a choice between available or consistent. All right, so indeed now we have uh, questions that I'm going to answer right now, and then we'll be continuing with the REST APIs right there. All right, so uh, go ahead, Dan. Go ahead. Sorry? Okay, so, so essentially what, what happens at, at peak load with the, the Amazon Web Services? Uh, what, what's the effect of peak load on, their, on the services they provide? So basically, if I correctly understand your question, you're wondering, does the problem go away? Because if there was a peak of connections at a certain time, and now you rent your power, you might still have the problem of the peaks at the level of all customers, right? Uh, but in, in, in fact, uh, what, uh, what happens in practice when you have an enormous amount of customers is that it kind of distributes and, and fades a bit away. So if you have millions of customers, uh, the, the, the peaks are much less, uh, uh, you, you feel them much less, right? I'm not saying that it's gone. Uh, it's probably still the case that most of the year they have idle capacities uh, with their servers and that sometime during the year you might have more peaks. Uh, uh, but more or less, the peaks might depend on the on the company and on the customer of Amazon. Uh, also, what's happening is that there's also uh, some hedge that is done across providers because typically, uh, if you are a, a provider like let's let's say Apple uh, that doesn't have cloud services, uh, they will typically use several of these cloud providers. They might have their own internal servers, but they will also partly. Uh, connect you to Amazon, to Google, and so on. And actually, if you have a firewall on your computer, you will see it. If you try to connect to these services, you might see occasionally that you're actually connecting to the Amazon cloud, right? So as a summary, the peaks might not go away, but if you have millions of people co-using the, the servers, the problem is reduced, let's say. D did I answer your question? Yes, it does. And do you have another? So if you can further explain a bit uh, the concept of durability and what exactly is an object, how can it, uh, how these two elements tie in together, essentially? Yeah. So object, it's just a matter of terminology, really. An object is just a file. It can be a picture. It can be a video. It can be a CSV file that has data. It can be uh, an XML file, a JSON file. It, it, it's a file, really. It's just that when you talk about cloud storage and object storage, instead of saying file, we just say object, right? This is basically the difference, but it's really the same thing. It's just a sequence of bits, uh, like, like, any, like any, uh, uh, any file, right? Now, the durability, 
is a guarantee on the loss of these objects. Maybe you put an object like you upload your favorite picture to, your, to, to the cloud, and then you let it there and you come back in a year, you would like to see it, right? You would like to have it back. You don't want to lose it, right? Uh, imagine that it's the backup of your computer that you put in the cloud, maybe encrypted. You don't want to lose it either, right? So the durability guarantee promises you that there is less than a certain probability of loss, right? Like one in a hundred billion objects per year might get lost. How, if it's not enough for you, just store it twice. Duplicate the object, store it twice, and then you have what a 10 to the power of 22 that both of them uh, would be lost, right? Did it answer your question? Do we have another? No, that's fine. Okay, uh, we have one from the Zoom chat. And the question is, most of the Amazon data centers are tier three. How do they provide services better than tier three guarantees? All right, so here I might need to actually come back to you on that and check offline. Uh, on exactly, because that, uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean with tier threes. Does it have to do with security or is it some uh, some other terminology? Just want to make sure. Let me wait for a few seconds. Okay. We also have a question for the from the room. Should I take that in the meantime? All right, yes, let's pick the other question, then we'll come back to it. And otherwise, I'll, I'll look at it offline. Go ahead. Right. What's the question? So the latency between, the difference between latency and response time and the second one? Oh, I, sorry, I didn't understand. I, okay, Gisan, can you start with the difference between latency and response time? And I'll get in the meantime the second part. So here, they are fundamentally more or less the same thing. The, it's basically the grundsatzlich in, in, in Swiss German. It's grundsatzlich, it's the same thing. Um, the idea is that uh, it depends what you're talking about. Uh, if it's something small, like a small object, uh, what I call latency, at least uh, last week, is the time that separates the moment that you send your request and the moment when you start downloading the object. And then we are talking about throughputs for the time that now you are actually uh, shipping the bits over the network. So you can either consider the time between the request and the start of the download or the total time from the request to the end of the download. You always need to be clear what you actually are speaking about. And it's true that some people use latency for the total time, for the, the until the end of the download. This basically makes a difference for large objects. If it's a small object, the download is typically so small that it comes down to the same thing, right? So the answer is really depending on the context because people might mean different things, right? So, so uh, um, uh, I think that in the case of the, re the, 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 the promise on the response time, it's probably in the sense of the time that separates the request from the start of the download, because if you have a terabyte object, then I don't think they can promise that to give it to you in 10 milliseconds uh, if you have a, a terabyte object. So it's likely that they really mean the, 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 the start, the, 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 the time that separates from the, the first bit of data that you start receiving, right? And in that case, it means it's the same as what I called latency last time, all right? Okay, and, uh, and a follow-up on this is there, um, what is the SLA for latency defined as? Is there a difference between it and what the- That's the same thing as the response time. It's the, it's, it's the same thing. When you promise that in 99.9% .9 of the cases, you will have the first bit within 10 milliseconds, for example. Is that okay? Okay, I think that's fine. Uh, should we take more questions if there are any, or should we go ahead? Are there any more questions? No, I think it's fine. We can go ahead. All right, perfect. And I'll come back to you for, for the chat. I saw the tier three, I look into it. Uh, it's tiers of availability. I, I'll investigate. Maybe you can take a note of that, Dan, and uh, I'll, I'll look at it offline, right? I'll come back to you. Uh, and on terminology, I repeat, words can change from person to person. We will see uh, that the, the same thing can be called different things. 
you already have an example with object and file. Object and file is really the same thing, but it just depends in which context you are talking about them, right? So do not be afraid of having the same word for different things or of having the same thing with different words, as long as you understand what you're speaking about and always clarify what you are speaking about, All right? Okay, so let's now continue with the REST API. So the REST API is how do you access the system? How do you use the service? So in general, this is not just for S3. This is for any system, any, anything, any database product. There are several ways you can use the product. You can have a driver. The driver is a piece of software that you have on your computer uh, that you can use to access the system. Uh, for example, back then in the old days for a printer or a scanner, then you needed to install a driver and then you connect to that driver and use the system. So typically you use the driver in a host language like Java, C++ and so on, Python, PHP, uh, and then you connect to the system. With PostgreSQL, this is typically what happens. In PostgreSQL, you have a PostgreSQL driver that you can use in any language to connect to the PostgreSQL database and you have it in PHP for your website and so on. Then there's other ways. SOAP, I'm not going to talk much about it. It's a, it's a way uh, to, uh, to provide over the web uh, with XML syntax access to a service, it's web services. However, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about REST. That is pretty much the same thing, but a, a bit more recent, uh, more simple and uh, over HTTP. So this means representational state transfer. Sounds scary, it's actually not scary at all because that's actually the web, that's actually HTTP. So you might know that the web, which is not the same thing as the internet, was invented 30 years ago, and now I feel older, uh, by Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, and uh, the HTTP protocol, hypertext transfer protocol, is how you transfer all of these things, web pages, but also data. And uh, so that these are just versions for your own uh, archives. The idea is that in HTTP and also REST, actually, this protocol, we think in terms of resources. We access resources. An object is a resource. A bucket is a resource. Everything is a resource, right? So when, when you see the world as a nail, uh, sorry, when you have a hammer, everything in the world looks like a nail, right? So for HTTP and REST, everything is a resource. And surprise, surprise, a resource is identified with a URI, right? So you might have heard of URI, URL, uh, they actually more or less mean the same thing. It's, it's just a bit messy in the terminology because it keeps changing. So at some time we had URN, URL, and the URI was either a URL or a URL, uh, URL, right? So the main difference is that a URL, a locator, locates an object over the web. So typically HTTP is a URL and the URN does not. For example, an email address, mail to blah, 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 is, a, is, is not a URL, it's a URL. But now it has been simplified. Now we just say URI and that's it. And it's anything that looks like this, that basically identifies a resource. So you have a scheme, very often HTTP, but you have others. You have FTP, you have mail to, you have ISBNs for books and, and plenty of them. Then you have an authority, a domain, maybe some of you own their own domains, right? There's also ethd.ch is an authority as well that follows, right? It's what you type in your browser too. Then you have a path slash separate it. Then after the question mark, you can have a query string. It's typically for sending data over a form, for example, over JavaScript, over your website. So these are parameters to your request. And then this is called the fragment with the sharp sign. It's typically if you access a sub page, a, a sub component of, of the resource, right? You can also see that as a black box, but basically whenever you want to access something, you have a, a URI like that that identifies your resource. It's like an ID, if you want, but it's an ID for the web. And the idea is that once you have a resource, you can do things with that resource, right? And by do, I mean methods, because that's called the method of HTTP. You can get a resource, you can put a resource, you can delete a resource, you can post uh, to a resource. But to be more precise, you don't actually get the resource, you get the representation of a resource because maybe your resource is a printer so of course if you say get from the printer you will not get the printer shipped over the internet right what you will get instead of that is some uh, some syntax in html or, uh, in xml or json that contains information about the print the printer right so you get a representation in some syntax uh, uh, of your resource you can put 
the, 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 to, uh, the, so some uh, representation of the resource in there, you can delete it and you can post. So over HTTP, whenever you use your browser, this is actually what happens. You send a request with a method and a resource and potentially some more information and you get back a status code, right? 404 not found, that's a status code. Everybody knows that one, but there's actually others. So if you actually looked behind the scenes, this is what you would see on your machine happening whenever you browse the web, right? You have the, the domain, you have the address, the, the version of HTTP, this is a get request if you get a web page and so on. And this is then the web page that comes and this is of course hidden from you and this is nicely displayed in your browser. So what's going on here? Of course, we are not browsing the web. We are trying to use cloud storage. Well, it turns out that you can also use the web and HTTP for talking from computer to computer, just programs talking to programs instead of a web page. So if you get, if you send a get method, a get request, it means that it's side effect free. You just get a representation of your resource. Right. A put request puts, for example, a file or an object, it puts there, and associate it with a certain uh, resource URI, right? It's even potent, of course, because if you do it twice, if you send twice uh, the same uh, uh, objects to put, then it's as if you had sent it only once, right? Uh, so it's it's called uh, idempotent. potent. Delete uh, is uh, is uh, when you it, it means that so so basically, if you've done a put and after that you do a get, then you expect to get back the same thing, right? But if you delete and then do a get, you will get a 404 not found, obviously, because you deleted it, so it's no longer there, right? So get, put, and delete are actually quite intuitive. And they are true for web pages. Of course, you cannot delete a web page that, that probably will uh, refuse it, but you, you can easily get web pages and that, that's intuitive. You can get object, put objects, delete objects, also with cloud storage. And finally, post is a little bit the one left for everything else. Uh, if you don't know what method to use, it's the more the most universal method that pretty much allows you to do whatever you want. For example, if you have a calendar service and you need to create a new entry in there, uh, it's not going to be a put because you would need to know the ID in advance, which typically you don't. So you post a request to the calendar service to add a new entry. It will return to you the ID and then you can use that ID in order to complete your entry. Right. So there's other methods than that, but just remember get, put, delete, and post that are the top four request uh, methods that are used over HTTP. So now let's come back to S3. S3 also has resource URIs to identify buckets. Uh, typically it's buckets, whatever name you have for your bucket, .s3.amazonlws.com. That's the resource URI for the bucket that you can use in your HTTP request. For an object, it's the same thing, but remember bucket ID and object ID, right? So you have the two things. You can build your URI and then use that to get and put objects uh, to uh, S3, all right? And then, of, then it's obvious, it's actually quite intuitive. You can put a bucket to create it. You can delete a, bu a bucket, you can get a bucket. Getting a bucket will not give you all objects. It will list the objects in the bucket if you do that. Then you can put an object in a bucket, you can delete an object uh, that will no longer be there, or you can get an object, right? That's pretty much how it works. At least if it's less than five gigabytes, it's that simple. Get, put, delete, uh, and uh, that, that, that's, uh, that's your REST API. These REST APIs are all over the place. We'll see next week with HDFS, there's also a REST API. Almost any data store has a REST API. Uh, and if you build one day also your own API or sorry, your own product or your own online service, you really should have a REST API. Why? Because this is the way you connect it to host languages. If you have a REST API, then you can access it from Python, from R, from Java, from C, from any language you want. So this is why you want a REST API. If you want a driver, you have to write a driver for every language and that's much more complicated, right? So this is why REST APIs today are extremely popular with, uh, with uh, products. But of course, not everybody has one. Uh, there are still people using drivers, uh, but if you start from scratch, I really recommend that recipe. Okay, now uh, let's get more into some um, tricky questions. Is S3 a file system? What do we mean with a file system? We typically mean that we have directories. And of course the answer is no. Because I told you S3 just maps IDs to objects. It's flat. It's just a key value model. 
an object ID associated with an object. So it's not a file system, it doesn't have a hierarchy, but you can emulate a file system. You can pretend to be a file system. How do you do that? Well, you can just put slashes in the names. And of course, slashes are a character like any other character and S3 doesn't care about the slash, but you as a human can interpret the slash as giving you some structure, right? So logically you can pretend that this, these are five object IDs, for example, and you can pretend that actually you have a hierarchy like that, right? It's just that this is only pretending. And indeed, if you go to S3, to the website, and look at your objects in your bucket, it will actually show it like this to you in your browser. But remember that it's only pretending. It's only an emulation by interpreting the slashes in there. Um, we'll see a, a real file system next week with HDFS, where we do have a real hierarchy of files, right? But for this week, it's flat. It's just an object ID associated with an object. It's a flat list with billions or trillions of objects, right? Okay, you can also statically host websites. If you don't have any PHP or fancy dynamic code that executes, if it's just static web pages, then S3 and the same for Azure Blob Storage and Google Cloud Storage, this is the cheapest way you can host a website in, uh, if, you, if, you, if you create a startup, for example. Right? So this is an example, the JSONic website, the language we'll use is hosted on S3 and it then access, it's accessible via URL right there and then you can buy it to your domain of course, right? So it's also very useful for websites and of course for your data sets because this is the reason we are doing all of that. So typically you can then upload all your data. Uh, it can be a single file. It can be also typically a, a thousand files or plenty of files that you spread your data over. And of course, in the rest of the course, we'll look closer what there is inside these files and how you structure the data that you ship over uh, to the cloud because there's a lot of formats that we are going to look into, a lot of different syntaxes. But what I'm saying is that object storage can store pictures, videos, video fragments. If you're a streaming service like Netflix, typically you store fragments or your videos in different resolutions. And then you let your television, your smart TV or whatever you're using fetch the appropriate resolution from a cloud storage service, typically. And I'm pretty sure Netflix uses other providers, maybe Amazon, maybe Google, maybe Azure, I don't know, but it's very likely. Uh, and uh, and uh, that's so for video. You can have a website, the static files of a website, and you can have your data. So you see, you can, you can, you can store a lot of things in there. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll actually do that uh, with uh, Azure Blob Storage, right? So a bit more on that. Now about the natural catastrophes that can happen and why we actually spread it all over the planet. So typically we don't have a single data center. Uh, if you're a cloud provider, you have plenty all over the world uh, and you try to have them on every continent, right? And even several on every continent. Why do we do this? We do this mainly for two reasons. The first reason is to optimize latency in the sense that we've seen before. If you have only servers in Europe, but you have customers connecting to your website from America, from Africa, from Asia, from Oceania. There's the speed of light. You can calculate quickly the take that it would time in the best case, the time it would take for the light, uh, for, for the signal to reach your customer. You are already looking at a two digit number of milliseconds. And that's the best case because in reality over the internet, it's, it's indirect and it can bump all over the place before it reaches the destination, right? So you really have, if you have customers all over the world to have uh, several data centers, if possible on every continent or where your customers are because it is faster. So if you use the cloud, you should pick typically Frankfurt. Uh, some now are also in Zurich. So the closest data centers, because this is going to be the fastest for you. Uh, but again, it depends where you are. There's also legal aspects uh, that force you to store your data at a certain place, uh, GDPR, for example, and all these frameworks. So that's the first reason is these latency things, maybe also legal reasons. The second is the resilience to natural catastrophes. If something happens at a place, you do want to have your data at some other place as well, because we want to be full tolerance. And this is why we replicate the data. So in that case, for example, we have five copies. If this disappears and this disappears, either because this happened to be the one in a hundred billion objects 
that disappears every year, or because there was an earthquake or whatever catastrophe that destroyed the data center, uh, but you still have uh, your, your data available somewhere else, right? These things happen. You see them in the news. There, there, there was, I, I think a few months ago, it, it happened again that a data center burnt down and some companies didn't replicate the data at other places and lost everything. And this is, this is an absolute tragedy when these things happen. So this is why you really have to have a plan and, and to put your data at, uh, at several places, right? And we'll talk a lot about replication in this lecture, replicate your data. Because you can have local failures on a single node, this is easier to solve, but you can have regional failures with natural catastrophes, right? All right, there's something else. For object storage is that you can also try to pay less if you want to pay less. For example, maybe you don't care about availability. Maybe you don't care about these 10 milliseconds. Imagine it's your backup of your hard drive. You lost your data. Maybe you can wait for a couple of hours or you can give them 24 hours to give you back your data. Then it's much cheaper. And then uh, maybe it can take hours to get. Why hours? It's not that they wait for hours, it's that typically it's stored on tape somewhere. Tape is extremely cheap. And then a human needs to go there or maybe a little robot needs to go all the way to fetch the tape and then it needs to be put in some machine and read and so on and so on. So this is why it takes time. But this is much cheaper if you, if you store it on tape. And this is why you have a choice of uh, how much you are ready to pay uh, uh, versus the availability uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the data and how fast you want to get your data. All right? So this is S3. And now I'm going to switch over to Azure Blob Storage. But first, I'm going to say it's pretty much the same thing. Right. Of course, there's always the bells and whistles that can be a bit different, uh, but, but uh, it's more or less the same thing. And I will not talk about Google Cloud Storage, but again, you will have no surprise at all if you look into Google Cloud Storage. All right. So here's the comparison. You will also understand why I started with, uh, with uh, S3. So um, in S3, we saw that to identify an object, so the object, wh wh what the identifier is made of is you need a bucket ID plus an object ID. These together identify an object, right? The, the, maybe I realize this is confusing object ID here. What I mean is what do we use to identify a specific object? A bucket ID plus an object ID, right? Uh, the object API is a black box. You just have, uh, you, you put and you get your objects and, and that's it, it's a black box, right? Um, in uh, terms of limits, it's up to five terabytes of data. Right, that, that you can have in a single object, it cannot be more than that, right? Now, what's different in Asia? The first thing that's different is that instead of a bucket and an object ID, bucket ID, object ID, you need three, not two, but three uh, IDs together. You need your account, that's maybe your email address or whatever, so your, your, your account is typically a string, a name. Then you need a container ID, it's the same thing as the bucket, really. Bucket ID, container ID. I warned you, right, that you might have different words for the same thing. Well, here you go. So container and bucket uh, is the same thing. And the blob, again, is the same as object. So instead of saying file or instead of saying object, they say blob. This is how it's called in Azure. And that's why it's called Azure Blob Storage. Blob means binary lar large object. That's why it's called blob. Um, Okay, so account ID, that's the thing that is specific to Azure, plus container ID, plus blob ID gives you your object. In terms of object API, it's slightly different from S3 because you have block blobs, append blobs, and page blobs. Block blobs give you actually exposure to these blocks that I told you about, that you can actually chunk your object into smaller blocks, and Azure Blob Storage shows that to you. So you can upload block by block, and you can get back your objects block by block, right? But blocks I'm keeping for next week with HDFS. This is why I don't talk too much about that, right? But Azure exposes the blocks to you. Then you have append blobs. These are optimized for logs. If you keep appending and appending and appending and appending data, then these are, this is the choice. And page blobs are typically if, if, you have, if you want random access to your data, for example, as the memory of a, of a virtual machine, all right? And finally, the limits are higher with Azure. In terms of blocks, block blobs, hard to pronounce block blobs, you can store 190 terabytes of data. That, that's absolutely enormous. What we are talking about is actually 50,000 blocks 
and each blocks can have up to four gigabytes of data, right? And if you do the math, this is what you get. Uh, Append gives you all the way to 190 gigabytes. It's only because the blocks are smaller. So at most four megabytes per block for this, but it's also 50,000 blocks at most. And then the page blobs, uh, only eight terabytes and, and the pages are much smaller. It's 500 characters, 512 bytes. All right. So you see, this is slightly more complex in terms of the possibilities that it gives to you. And that's the reason I started with S3, but you will see it's actually not that complicated uh, to use. It's just slightly, it has more bells and whistles, but the idea is the same. In Azure Blob Storage, you store your pictures, your videos, your data, your websites uh, uh, in there. Uh, and the API is just slightly more fine grains that, than the S3, uh, uh, the S3 API. And by the way, the black box again is not entirely true because uh, S3 actually does allow you to use blocks as well. So if you have uh, data above five gigabytes, it will actually request that you upload it one block at a time. It's just that it's not that explicit uh, in their API as explicit as with Azure. All right. So I hope that this helps the parallel between the two. And then in terms of the implementation of Azure, it's, uh, it's the idea that the account name selects the machine. So it's a virtual IP address, which on the internet identifies the machines. So it connects to the front end. The bucket ID gives you access to what is called the partition layer, right? So it's within uh, the, uh, the, um, the uh, what we call the storage stem, I will show you later. And the blob finally, which is the object, is to the streaming layer. Why? Because you stream the bits of your objects uh, uh, to, to actually get it. Think of Netflix. This is literally streaming, video streaming, right? All right, so account, container, and blob, specific to Azure, that's the same as a bucket for S3, and that's the same as an object for S3. Now, what is a storage stamp? Well, guess what? It's just one of these clusters with plenty of cheap commodity hardware that I've shown you before. We typically have 10 to 20 racks. So these are the towers like this. In each rack, there's 18 servers. So that's a lot of servers. And if you sum all the hard drives that you have in there, in all these racks, uh, it's 30 petabytes of data. It's a lot of data that you can fit in a single cluster in your data center. But typically, we try to keep it below 80% of storage capacity. If there's more, we try to just spread it over to a different data center. So we just try to rebalance, but we try to never have full, have full capacity. You know what happens if your hard drive is full, right? Then you get these annoying messages on your screen that tell you that you need to clean up and so on. You want to avoid that. So this is why we keep it below 80% of storage capacity. And if it exceeds that, we try to move it over to a different cluster because this is just one storage step, right? But of course, in Azure Blob Storage, there's a lot of storage steps. They claim to have exabytes uh, of data in their system. All right, so that's a storage step. And now you can connect that with the data center that I told you earlier, because we have these nodes here, the servers piled up in these racks, and then we have plenty of racks. And this here is a data center, what you see inside a data center. Now let's link that to replication too, because I told you about replication. You want to replicate the data to avoid losing it. How do you reach that you only lose an object in the case of Amazon one in a hundred billion times? Because I'm pretty sure you don't get that sort of durability with your hard drive. I'm pretty sure each one of you has experienced once losing data on your hard drive. I'm pretty sure you lost more than one in a hundred billion files uh, 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 per year in your life, right? So. How do you achieve that by replicating? If you store multiple copies, uh, then the risks that you lose all copies, it's much, much smaller. So how do we do that? Well, there's two ways. First, we store multiple copies within the same uh, machine. So it's in inside the, the, the stem within that cluster of machines via the stream lawyer, uh, uh, lawyer la layer. The lawyers are for the SLAs. So within the stream layer, we synchronously replicate. What does it mean? It means that when the user uploads the data, we block everything until this has been replicated within the step. This is what synchronous means. You block until this is done, synchronous. We have another kind of replication across steps. So here, maybe you're in Europe, you ship it over to North America, for example, uh, but this is done later. You do not block the user on that. You return to the user, say, yeah, yeah, that's okay. We sort everything in this storage stem, that's good. 
And then later in the day, or I don't know, you communicate with another data center somewhere else and asynchronously replicate again. And this works then over a different layer over the partition layers. This is automatic and it's asynchronous. So you need to understand the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. Okay, so then this is how it works. You connect with your accounts uh, to the DNS system. It gives you the virtual IP address of the, the stamp that you connect to the storage stamp. So the primary stamp uh, is the one responsible and there might be copies in other stamps. And then with the container and the blob IDs, you connect to this and then uh, you, you, you basically get all the data from, from that system, right? And here I just put again the replication. So inside the stamp synchronously across the stamps asynchronously. And as I said, North America, Europe, Asia, there's plenty of places that, uh, uh, that these servers are uh, located. All right, this is object storage. This is for storing large objects, pictures, data sets, videos, websites, and so on. So rather large objects. This has a key value model. Key value model means that we have an ID that can be bucket plus object ID or account plus container plus blob ID that identifies an object. So it's a key value model, uh, but you might have heard of key value stores as well. Key value stores are similar logically in the sense that they also have this key value model, uh, they are also used to store data, but on a different scale. And I'm also going to talk to you a bit about key value stores because they are also a bit relevant uh, for big data, even though we, we will see some concepts of that later in the lecture, but I'm not going to spend more time than just today and tomorrow on key value stores, right? So why key value stores? Can we consider an object store a database? What would it mean, right? In, an ob in, in a database, you store records. It's these tables that we spoke about last week. You have tables, the tables is made of records. So in a database, you want to get a record and put a record, right? Could you use S3 or Azure Blob Storage as a database and every object would be a record? Then you can put a record and get a record from the, from the cloud storage. People tried that. There's been even papers, even here at ETH about using S3 as a, as, as, as a database, right? But there's reasons why it doesn't quite work to actually do, do it that way. It's not very efficient. Uh, and uh, the reason has to do with latency is that, so of course it depends on the, on the promise that you get, but typically if, if, uh, if uh, on, on, on S3, uh, uh, they promise to you a few hundreds of milliseconds. It, it really depends. You need to look at the details and the, the level that you pick, but typically below 10, like one milliseconds, two milliseconds, you will not get that out of S3 or similar services, right? So uh, a typical database system like PostgreSQL and so on will promise to you this sort of, uh, this sort of latency, right? So this shows that you cannot really directly use uh, um, as, 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 a, as, a, as a database uh, system, S3 or Azure Blob Storage. However, you can still use the same model with key value stores. So the idea is that we still have IDs that are mapped to objects, right? Uh, but the objects will be smaller. Instead of up to five terabytes, an entire video of a movie or a series episode, uh, we typically have only kilobytes here. So 400 kilobytes in the case of Dynamo, which is also an Amazon technology, all right? So in a key value store, we have smaller values, and this is because it's meant to have these gets and puts much more often than in uh, object storage. So more values, but smaller values, right? And we'll not call them objects, we'll call them values. Again, it's a matter of terminology, right? So it's why it's called the key value uh, store and not a key object store. All right, and we don't even have metadata. In S3, you can have metadata. You can annotate all your objects with some extra uh, metadata and information on them, like access control and so on, not in a key value store. All you have is the value. So the data model, as I said, is, uh, is based on, on, uh, on uh, IDs that are mapped to values. Another name for ID in that context is key. A key is something that, that, that points somewhere. So you have a key associated with a value. So now we have a lot of synonyms, right? Key ID to mean the same thing, object, value, file, blob uh, to, to, to also mean the same thing. So it requires a bit of flexibility, but you see in every environment you have all of these synonyms, right? Okay, but nevertheless, this is called a key value model. 
So the API also will remind you of the API of S3 and of the uh, uh, Azure Blob storage and Google Cloud storage as well, because it's get put. You get a key to so get the value associated with a key and you put a value to be associated with that key. So get and put, right? Uh, so get the key gives you a value and putting the, uh, the, the some other value in the key replaces the value with this other value, right? But actually in Dynamo, there is one more thing, but I'll come back to it tomorrow, this context. Uh, when you get a key, you also get a context together with the value. And when you put uh, another value, you need to provide that context. I will not tell you what that context is because you will know tomorrow. I, I will explain to you, it has to do with conflict resolution. For now, let's just say it's a, it's a black box, right? Okay. So why do we simplify things? Because you, now you might be asking, we have PostgreSQL, we have relational databases. Why, why do we even need a key value store? And why can we just not use PostgreSQL or relational database, right? If you want a key value model in a relational database, it's easy. Just create a table with two columns. The first column is the key. The second column is the value, right? And, 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 and you can make the key the primary key of the table so that it's, uh, it indexes the, uh, the records. And for the value, you have data types in PostgreSQL that, that allow you to have blob. It's even called blob, right, in a, in a relational database. So you can store uh, uh, binary uh, uh, objects in a relational database. So it raises the question, why do we not just go ahead and use PostgreSQL and use it as a key value store with tables with two columns? Well, this has to do with the CAP theorem I told you earlier is that you can have more features in PostgreSQL or relational database. It will give you consistency also in a relational database, but it will be a bit slower and it will be monolithic. It's a single machine when you install PostgreSQL. With a key value store, you scale. You get more performance. It's much faster because it does much less, right? So it's easy to be faster. It scales. You can scale much more data in a key value store than in PostgreSQL or relational database because you can scale over a cluster, over multiple machines. And we sacrifice consistency in a key value store. I also come back to that tomorrow because we want availability. Availability is what we desire the most, right? And because we want to be partition tolerant and highly available, we have no choice but to sacrifice consistency. And this is why we replace it with eventual consistency, right? It's that the, the, the updates propagate, but it takes some time. It will eventually propagate everywhere, but not instantly, right? So it's eventually consistent. I'm checking the time because again, I, I, I want to finish a bit ahead of time. So maybe uh, one, one more minute, then maybe I'll take a question and then we'll, that will give enough time to ventilate the room for the lecture after us, which I think is linear algebra. All right. So um, this key value stores, this key value model that I told you about, again, this is how you would do it in a relational database, right? Key column, a value column, the key is there, the value is there. What is this in terms of algorithms and data structure, right? You, you learn these things on a conceptual level. What is the most efficient data structure for querying something like that? It's actually called the map, that's the abstract data type, or an associative array. We'll see them again in the lecture, in the context of uh, JSON, XML, and so on and so on, right? But just on, from a logical perspective, the key value model is an associative array. And this, this is also true for S3, for Azure Blob Storage, this is all an enormous associative array with trillions of different keys in there spread all over the planet. Uh, so in the end, it's really, uh, it's really just a map. All right, and I'll continue tomorrow on that. Do we have any questions? Otherwise, we'll call it a day. Not from the room, I don't think so. Not, all right, not from the room and uh, over the internet, I think there's nothing either. All right, so. Thank you everybody for following today's lecture. I'll see you tomorrow at, uh, at 9.15 in, uh, in the, uh, across the street in the other building or online. You are also free to attend online. And then I'll show you more about the key value stores uh, and that will close this week's chapter on uh, objects uh, and key value storage. So thank you very much. Thank you Dan for moderating this lecture and I will see you tomorrow. <laughs>